I'd like to introduce to you Jeff Duddy. Jeff has been doing some work with us and we asked him to commission, we asked him to do this report for us because of the emerging interest around uh, feedlotting and from a producer perspective about the profitability of feedlotting and also from a processor supplier um, perspective on trying to shore up an even supply of lambs, particularly out of season lambs rather than spring lambs. It's an important issue for the sheep industry um, and um, being able to engage with new markets, but also to be able to maintain some of the markets, um, particularly in the chilled sector rather than the frozen sector. Jeff uh, is from New South Wales. He's a, an ex-DPI New South Wales officer, uh, but he's been working out in the industry uh, for many years now. Jeff uh, runs nine to 10 lifetime management groups on the East Coast. He's done a considerable amount of um, practical application of feedlotting research across New South Wales. Uh, and he's going to present some of the findings of his report. The report, there are some hard copies there. It's also available on our website, including a, an appendix which documents a whole range of the uh, setup factors and costs as well. So uh, if you have any trouble finding that, let us know um, and I can make sure you get those. And uh, if we have your email addresses, if you're RSVP'd, we'll send out a copy of Jeff's presentation slides as well so um, but he is hoping to do some interactive um, work on the uh, feedlot calculator so people are aware of how that works so Jeff I'd like to welcome you and thanks very right, much mate. welcome everyone um, Mandy thank you um, again thanks for the opportunity to actually uh, put a submission in for this analysis it took a fair bit of work um, pretty sobering stuff uh, there's a lot of interest in finishing lambs um, as Mandy said, I, I work principally with New South Wales DPI and my main focus while with them and since leaving the department um, has been feedlotting, grain finishing of lambs and um, I've been banging on to years telling people it's not worth doing uh, and I'll stick by that because it's uh, quite an expensive process. There aren't always, um, there isn't always a margin to be made. So hate to sort of uh, break the news to you first up but we'll have a look at the, uh, the analysis that we undertook. The um, information behind uh, and the assumptions that we made as part of this um, study or report. Uh, if we get a chance, if there is anyone locally here or at the other sites that want to actually run through the calculator and try a few different scenarios, um, we can show you how the actual feedlot calculator will, will generate likely profit or loss. So the project objectives, it was a desktop analysis report, there were sort of two sections, one based on the infrastructure requirements and construction costs of anywhere from a 10 to 50,000 um, head feedlot. We, after discussion with Mandy and, and Daffo, actually suggested that we look at three to 5,000 um, head feedlots as well, because that is a reasonable size um, producer-driven commercial sort of scale uh, operation. We thought it was important to actually have a smaller scale, if you like, um, as part of the, the brief and also look at feedlot profitability with respect to the feed prices and the purchase and turnoff times of the stock. <clears throat> we thought the best way to attack it was to actually uh, use the law of averages, if you like, and, and bring everything down to one base. So we actually set up a model farm unit um, from which we use that as a standard base and then sort of develop from there. Uh, and running the different scenarios all based around a, a, a central starting point, if you like. So. We um, picked an area around Broom Hill um, and got some background information on the farm there uh, and I'll go through some of that in a second. The reason we picked that area is that it was fairly central to a lot of the major um, abattoirs and was also fairly close to the Katanning sale yards which is um, a great opportunity for people to source lambs um, and all sale as well. The model farm we looked at uh, in that area we, somewhere around 1800 hectares. The principal enterprise mix and breakdown cereals were about 65% arable uh, on the property, so about 65% of the area was uh, um, basically given out to cereals, the remaining being um, grazing, and you had options there of grazing canola or cereal crops in the winter spring, um, your stubbles and any fodder crops over the summer period. We thought it important that um, we have existing infrastructure, um, and we're not going to run through it to the 
degree that we did this morning with the, the group this morning, but we're going to cut out a lot of the, uh, the background um, economics and the like, if you like, or the analysis for working out the different costings of the different um, size systems. It is all in the appendix of the report, so if you've got a copy there and like to have a look at that, please do so. But we thought it important that we um, at least have some gear on farm, so as the listing shows there, we're looking at a, a reasonable shearing shed, sheep yards with a capacity of 3,500 at any one time, hay shed, silos, um, augers and the like. Um, and also access to the Great Southern Water Scheme, um, Stock and Domestic Scheme, hopefully, as part of it. We've used the option of, um, of having that as a principal water source, but also uh, costed separately as well with the, with the analysis um, if you had to actually set up uh, and have at least two to three days water storage on farm with uh, water tanks. We looked at five base feedlot systems. We analysed those using the Sheep CRC um, feedlot calculator. Um, I was involved with the development of that program uh, while with the department um, and we also developed some um, Excel based sort of program to analyse some of the data as we went through. I looked at what I'm calling capacity and maximum annual throughputs for these five systems. Capacity being say a 5,000 head feedlot, that's the capacity at any one time but let's say that's the only, you only do the 5,000 for the year versus the maximum throughput which for that sort of system is around 43,000 lambs a year. So we're looking at the two ends of the scale for um, economies of scale if you like or uh, efficiencies. We went right through to a 50,000 head feedlot. Um, from that model farm we used 5,000 head feedlot base and then had it, had it as a model or modular sort of system so basically the costing for a 5,000 head um, feedlot it was X dollars and if it was 10,000, well that's two modules and you just kept, kept adding on a module as needed. Um, this is the background assumptions that we use. The uh, lambs we were based on were crossbred lambs. Starting and final weights were 38 kilos live and 50 kilos finished, which were really sort of equate to about a 17 kilo or your restock of feeder type lamb, um, up to about 23 kilo trade lamb. Starting values, and these values are based on the average up to the time of the report um, for 2017. So we had the um, restock of feeder lamb average, or your starting weight lamb average around $93.65, or $5.51 including skin value per kilo. And the final value about $133.40 for that 23 kilo trade lamb. Growth rate, we had down around about 280 grams a day. Um, 43 days finishing, so a six week period, uh, but that also at 280 grams a day takes into account the first two weeks, um, which are, you know, really lambs don't do a hell of a lot on uh, during the introduction period. So to average around about 280 grams a day over the period is, is probably close to an industry average. Daily intake, 3.5% of live weight. Um, we used a pellet based ration, mainly because WA is very big on use of pellets. And again, for this sort of analysis, it made it pretty easy to standardise the ration as one particular type. I didn't include any wool income at all as part of the, um, the analysis through the calculator, the feedlot calculator. It does make a difference. Uh, it does actually make the figures look a little bit better, um, depending on the amount of wool you cut, obviously, and, and the value of that wool. Um, and the discussions we had this morning, it's, uh, to be honest, merino lambs probably really come into their own in that situation with the current value of wool. We assumed that lambs were going to come into the feedlot pretty well off shears or short wool anywhere from two to four weeks off shears. <clears throat> the ration based on pellets and 10% hay, I'm very big on keeping roughage in the system. Um, energy, 12.7 megs of energy, 16% protein. Uh, the ration cost, a uh, base cost we started with was around $298 a tonne. Uh, feed conversion of 6 to 1, which again is an industry average. And the total average feed per lamb over the period was 77 kilos in intake. The other assumptions, deaths, shy feeders and your sale percentage. Pretty well again industry um, standards, 1% deaths, hopefully we could have a little bit less than that, but 1% deaths, 5% shy feeders, 94% were sale lambs. I'll just say the program actually values your shy feeders. It takes into account that they have eaten during the period that they're in the feedlot and it assigns a 20% value above its starting price. 
So the, the starting price, base starting price was $93. So the side feeders are valued out of the system 20% above that. <clears throat> um, we have our normal sort of health um, costs, the drench, fly, ADE, B12 and clostridials, that's around $2.30. Transport cost in and out, $2 in, $3 out. Slaughter levy, which everyone pays. Your sale commission around 5.5%. Um, the system we set up was a self-feeder system, um, working on $0.05 cents per lamb per day as labour cost. If we'd have worked on a bunker-style system like cattle feedlot, open-style bunker system, we'd be looking at least $0.10 cents a lamb a day and possibly more, depending on the number of times that you actually feed out. Machinery operation costs $13 a tonne to actually run your machinery to actually fill and process grains or whatever if, if you're doing that. Um, and that's one area that a lot of producers and the like, when doing sums, don't take into account. Okay, the running costs. The other thing is um, interest on purchased land. We, we value that at 8%, so basically an overdraft. And you know those add up. Those all add up when it comes down to working out your profitability overall. Capital costs were all based on these 5,000 head modules. That included the building, yards, feeders, shade and shelter, machinery, landforming and water infrastructure. For every five or every module increase, so for every 5,000 lamb increase, I actually reduced cost by 2.5%. Um, just to take into account economies of scale, so you're saving a little bit. It's not, it doesn't cost as much per unit uh, as you go into a, a bigger capacity. So we took that into account as we built our way up to a 50,000 head feedlot facility. Fencing wise, 40 by 50 metre pens, uh, 2,000 square metres, holding around about uh, 500 lands, which is four square metres of lamb. Industry recommendations around five square metres. I'm reasonably comfortable with that. I'd actually like to see more area per lamb, but we made it so you could run up to 500 per pen. Pretty standard uh, and cheap sort of infrastructure with using your ring lock, um, posts, plain wires and the like. Still cost around about $7,000 a kilometre. Uh, that include all, all wire, gates, um, assemblies and labour. I didn't cost in sick pens. Actually, uh, we assigned two sick pens for every 10 feedlot pens. Um, we just assumed that they would be set up somewhere in or, in or around your existing yards or existing facilities. The feeders, I went for a self-feeder system, single-sided, and um, I will say, I talked to Bruce Clark from Universal um, and used him as a base. I tried to use as much WA information as possible. I asked, okay, what are we looking at with his Universal feeder if we split it lengthways, and then put backs to it and assign those as a single-side feed. So we worked on some costings there. You got about 15 days of feed per feeder. Uh, before you needed to refill, and that was a big saving, a big saving compared to filling out or preparing and filling out feed every day in a trough sort of system. I actually looked at analysing um, the cost saving labour wise uh, with having self, self feeders. The cost of actually establishing this sort of feeder system was recouped under all systems within a year, just in labour saving. So we're only costing you five cents a lamb a day with self feeders versus 10, 15 cents or whatever is doing a open trough sort of bunk style feeder, you actually pay for the feeders in a very short time. Shade and shelter, um, I went for echo shelters, which uh, we have producers here that certainly use them and they're uh, certainly being used in the eastern states. Um, to give the option of also of actually locking the lambs up during wet weather under those systems giving them about 1.2 square metres of lamb, which is um, well and truly above the industry average for requirement anyway. <clears throat> if they are able to um, be locked up during wet weather, that's a big plus for processors. You haven't got the soiling of the, um, the skins and the like and, the, and potentially carcasses when they're processed. And there's the option there for deep litter, particularly straw-based systems, where that can be value added on farm, um, either composted and, and sold on or used on farm. We tried to use as much um, best industry practice or recommendations as possible. Um, a lot of this information is based on the code of practice that uh, we put together with, for MLA. Um, and also, you know, I'm not a trained nutritionist or a trained economist, but 
I'm right into the social side, the, the, the social aspects and, and production issues um, within feedlots and really try to look at mitigating sort of any stress factors. So, Water costs, again, I won't go into those too much. They're in the report. Um, basically looked at a supply line and having two points in each um, feedlot pen, um, again, to actually help reduce with stress issues. I did um, look at costing out concrete aprons under the feed troughs and also the water pens. I think they're important. It's a big cost. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's well and worth it, well and truly worth it when uh, particularly during wet weather. Land forming, I estimated that to be about 35 hours or 250 bucks an hour for every 5,000 land feedlot module. These are the basics we looked at, a 2 to 4% um, slope per pen, contour banks and bungs, sedimentation ponds, general drainage, or whether access to the site. And again, for every 5,000 land module, um, we'd increase and then drop 2.5% off the costing of of um, land forming and the like as well, depending on the scale uh, of the feedlot that we went, were going to. Don't worry too much about all that information again, that's in the actual, um, in the uh, report, but that's just a summary of all the costs. We're looking here at 5,000 head feedlot uh, with its annual throughput, maximum throughput, 43,000 lambs and the like. So if you're leisure, you can go through and, and look at those different figures. Prior to doing the actual report, I thought it important that we looked at WA's lamb and mutton prices, price variations, and what I call relativities, which I'll uh, walk you through in a couple of minutes. If you look at this graph, we're looking at the restock of feeder lambs, which we basically call store lambs in the eastern states, and the trade lamb values going back to 2010. Most of these graphs from here on in go for that seven year period, 2010 to 2017. If you can just see what's happening here in the last 12 months, our blue line is actually the trade lamb average price and our restock of lambs, feeder type lambs, and they're actually crossing over and be making more per kilo most times in the last six to 12 months. That's the big issue when it comes to finishing lambs. Most people, when asked the question, what is your cost, major cost when feedlotting, will tell you your ration. It's not, it's that starting price of the lamb. It's the main driver uh, and main impact on profit. This graph, similar sort of thing, <clears throat> but this is average out over the year. What we're looking at here is your merino lamb, which is that green line. You have our restocker lamb prices, which is the blue line, and our trade lamb prices here in WA, the red line. What this graph shows, and this is 2010 to 2017, and again, this is just across the, across the year, but averaged out the annual variation, highs and lows, of those lamb category prices throughout the year. If we just look at the Merino one at the moment, you're looking up here, and I'll just click on the next one. At the peak, if this is the average price across that 12 month period, Merino lambs are peaking around about this sort of June, July. That's when they really come into their own, the prices for 16 to 22 kilo Merino lambs. And that on average is around 33% above the average across the year. And then they drop right away during the spring period, really go down to you know, under 50%. So there's a huge range there. If you look at your trade lambs, which are the red line, we're looking at 11% peak down to a 17% drop in the sort of November or your spring sort of period. So that's a 27, 28% difference in price, depending on what time of year you sell. If you haven't got a contract, you can look at that sort of price variation and say, well, okay, when do I sell? This may not necessarily be the least profitable time for you to sell, particularly if they're straight off mum, but your prices, are, as, you, as you know, are going down this time of year. There's volume, there's numbers in the system. When we look at the mutton job, exactly the same sort of price pattern, but a, a, a really big uh, range in peak and troughs. We're looking at 20% when it peaked versus 12% here, so a 32% difference in actual price from the top time of the year to the, when it bottoms out. And again, it's all supply driven. These are really good or really strong reasons why we should be changing, not so much the mutton job, but changing in the lamb job, our time of lambing, and supply patterns. Same happens over in the eastern states. We are swamped with lambs in the spring. Prices drop away. We normally have a bit of a peak coming around about March, and then our July sort of period is our traditionally our high pre price time as well. Okay, the relativities. What I've done here is looked at 
the store lamb or your restock of feeder lamb price at point A, and then eight weeks later, what you sold him for as a trade lamb using NLRS figures. Okay, and then I've taken this price back and compared it to, on a percentage base, what the original lamb's value was. Clear as mud? And basically, coming from it, the same thing again has been happening in New South Wales, the eastern states for the last five to ten years. We get to this point here, somewhere around 85%, this relativity, relative value of the restock of lambs versus trade lamb, somewhere around 85%. If you are above that, or well, if the lamb prices are above that, the risk is really high that you're not going to do very well. Profit margins um, are likely to be fairly low if your starting lamb value is more than 85% of the finished lamb value. So just to show what we've done, again, this is just a screenshot from the report. We've got our restock of feeder lamb here at this period. Eight weeks later, that was the reported price for the sale yard system for the trade lamb when we finished that lamb from the feedlot and put him into the, into the uh, market. What do we do then? So we've got a 17 kilo carcass lamb, he's worth 90 bucks. 23 kilo trade lamb, eight weeks later, it's worth 139. So that's $5.29 a kilo, including skin value, and $6.04, including skin value for the trade. You just divide that one by that one, and that says 88%. So that value of your restock of feeder type lamb divided by your finished lamb value is the relativity. You do not just go $90 divided by 139, because that comes out about 65%. This is the figure we want to look at. And if you're 85% and above, most times your profit margin is going to be fairly low. Okay, unless your starting price of the lamb is quite low. Just to show you that it works in New South Wales as well, again, this is that 85% relativity. Our yellow line here is WA. The blue line is what's happening in New South Wales up to the end of last year. We were over here last year actually um, doing some workshops with, with Jonathan and Daffer and the like, and I thought, well, WA, your relativity is actually dropping away. So the chances of making good dollars out of your lambs in WA was going to be pretty good. Didn't necessarily work out that way. If we look at seasonal impacts for this relativity, so when do you buy? We've got summer, autumn, winter and spring. These are average over the um, seven year period. There's that 85%. You can see that on average, over the last seven years, your relativity has been above that 85%. Summer's not a bad time to buy. Autumn's not a bad time to do it. But the winter's not particularly good. Why? Winter time, you're buying lambs, you're going to finish them and then put them into the spring market when the prices are dropping. And so you've got older lambs going into the market, they're going to be starting to focus on your sucker lamb. And so the actual relativities, um, on average, I think we're about 107% for that late winter sort of purchase period. So we just don't look at it. So we only feedlot for eight to nine months of the year. Well, it's only really profitable or potentially profitable for that, for that period. So the feedlot calculator, Ooh. that's just a snapshot. Hopefully again, yeah, we'll have some time to actually run through it when we open up. And this is um, just an example. That's um, the sort of information we need to put in. Any yellow cell is where we enter the information. So that's the calculator that we developed. We had the five operational sizes. We had capacity versus maximum throughput. Um, use 2017 averages for trade land prices, your restock of feeder prices, and a base price of 298 for your pellet ration. And I will say, when we looked at anal analysing and dropping the pellet price by 5 or 10%, or increasing at 5 or 10%, it didn't make a big impact on your actual uh, margin at the other end. So we, we kept most of them at uh, most of the analysis when we did it at $298 a tonne. For all these other things, your starter land price, your trade land price, we drop by 5 or 10% in various sort of um, mixes, if you like. I'll show you what I mean. So we're here, the base price, which again is the average price for 2017 when we did the analysis, was 93.65 for your restock of feeder. So we also run um, analysis using 10% below that or 5% below that or starting price is actually 5 or 10% above that. Trade lamb, similar sort of thing. We either drop the prices and, uh, or increase them. And again, whoop, the ration. Um, as I said, they're the sort of prices we could have used, but it didn't make a big impact. Not as big as your starter lamb value. 
That's in one of the appendixes. I don't expect you to see that, that clearly. Um, I'm sorry for putting so much information up on the screen, but that's a snapshot of profitability. Anything in red is a loss. Just looking at those blue ones, and this first one here, and I've used base, so that's the $93 for your starting value. Base meaning $133 for your finishing. Um, the relativity was 95. Under that scenario with $298 um, ration, there was a fair bit of loss going on in every single feedlot situation. Just with this we've got, so this column here is 5,000 lambs, that's all you finish in that feedlot for the year, versus your maximum throughput, 44,000, and 10,000, maximum input, 20,000 and so on. It's not till we got down to, and you'll notice, it's these ones with the yellow cells, they're the ones that were below, 85% or below for that relativity. So that's all them there. It's not until we sort of got into that system that we started making dollars. Again, that starting price of the lamb is the big killer. We were making fairly good dollars <clears throat> in this scenario here where the starter lamb price was 10% below and our finished lamb price was 10% above the average for 2017. That's the main warning. Margins are tight. They always have been, they always will be. There will be periods when you can make good dollars. Okay, but you've got to do the figures. If you haven't got a contract, you can at least look at these relativities and try and work out, okay, what do I need to make in six or eight weeks' time? This is just three scenarios. I'm not going to bore you with too many graphs after this, but if we look at the grey bars here, we're looking at the um, restock of feeder being 10% below and the trade lambs 10% so 10 cents above or 10 percent above these light blue lines here is when we've got our base or average prices used at 93 dollars and 133 dollars and the dark blue lines is when you restock of lambs with 10 percent above that or 10 and 10 percent lower returns for your trade so you know it's only these sort of systems where that restock of price is lower than currently trading that you actually got a fairly good chance of making that margin so the main thing from profitability, the relative value of that restock of feeder lamb to the finished lamb product. That's the main driver of the whole thing. Throughput's important. The more you put through, the uh, less loss in most occasions, but also um, the better efficiencies. We'll show you why in a second. Also, the timing of purchase and marketing of your finished product. Winner pretty well is out, the grain finishing lambs. It's also affected to a lesser degree by things like feed prices, Establishment cost and operational scale. So larger operations, they're likely to return greater profits or lose less just because of economies of scale, but the risk obviously is higher. Just want to show you these two graphs. This is from the same feedlot system. There's 5,000 lambs versus maximum throughput from that 5,000 lamb facility, 43,000 lambs. What the calculator does is actually assigns a value to um, the lambs for, to cover depreciation on capital. When you're putting through more lambs, this is our fixed cost here or depreciation on capital we're trying to cover. It's about a dollar that you have to get from your lamb to actually pay for depreciation. When you're doing fewer numbers, that skyrockets. This is only for a 5,000 head facility. Now, once the bigger facility's there, it can be really add up very quickly. So, on a hot standard carcass weight basis, to take a lamb from $93 uh, restock of feeder lamb through to a trade lamb, finished trade lamb, each additional kilo of carcass weight costs about $6.20. So what's that mean to you guys? You've got to make more than $6.20 a kilo to make it worth your while. I've been telling producers, and most would agree in the eastern states in particular, that you wouldn't bother feedlotting a lamb unless you were making about $8 or $10 minimum profit. Okay, so to do that, to make an $8 to $10 profit, processors either have to be paying you an extra 40 to 50 cents above that, or we want to see the starting price of the lambs drop by a similar sort of amount, which is not going to happen. We've got a situation, we've had a situation for at least the last five years where we've got a huge interest in finishing lambs, but we've got a diminishing ewe base. We've got less lambs out there. So it really is in demand. 
And most people are actually better off setting up and selling lambs as store lambs or your restocker slash feeder type lambs. Turn them off. Leave the ewes on farm to get fatter and give you more lambs next year. If the season's against you, and we're all facing that at the moment, except Victoria, by all accounts in, in, in Australia, is the season's against you, more often than not, you're going to be better off selling those lambs to someone else. And I love the principle of feedlotting, right? but it really comes down to the economics. So what are the recommendations? Do a thorough cost-benefit analysis, regardless of the size of the operation before you set up. Analyse your restock of feeder patterns or relativities if you haven't got a contract price. We are lucky in the eastern states, but last year they actually had contract prices out in the spring. We've never seen contract prices prior to that in the, in the spring. So they could see that there was going to be a problem with lamb supply last year, so they stepped up, processors stepped up and put, put um, contracts out. Maximise your lamb throughput regardless of the size of the operation. That's going to um, help with profitability a bit. Greater emphasis, industry-wide, this is an industry issue, greater emphasis needs to be placed on modifying the lamb supply patterns, right, and minimise these price variations. And I know here in WA you're, you're very cereal-centric, if you like. Everything revolves around the cropping program. But for the life of me, given how strong the sheep and lamb markets are and have been and will continue, I don't understand why we aren't seeing that, <coughs> excuse me, real increase of people getting back into sheep. There's plenty of interest here. They tell us they're interested. I know seasonal conditions knock us around a fair bit, but if you look at actually the returns, possible returns from the, the sheep, um, sheep enterprise, I don't know why you're so centric around cropping. You might say it's too hard to actually do that, but I just want to show you what's happened in New South Wales. If you look, this is a period 2000 to 2016. The red line here is Western Australian land prices and the annual variation. The blue line is the eastern states. So that's 2000 to 2016. That's 2005 to 2016. That's the last five to seven years. In New South Wales, we've evened out a hell of a lot. Some of it's been driven by processes. Some of it's been driven by climate change, where we have people changing lambing times and the like. And I know we're not as focused in the eastern states as you are here with your cereal crops and the like, but it can be done. So, Again, if you look at your difference between your price peak and your price trough, you're looking 30% difference in, in lamb prices between coming forward two months or so, it can make a huge difference. You need to look seriously at establishing producer, finisher and or processor alliances. A lot of this should be driven by processors. They need to be getting out there and getting producers together and saying, OK, we need these lambs, you supply the product that we want, you background these lands, there's something else I'm getting to in a minute, right? you give us the product that we need or that we can finish and, and get a, a decent sort of job out of, um, and they should be paying you for it. <clears throat> Promote the benefits of um, an uptake of things like backgrounding or imprinting. They background in the beef job. Imprinting, there's, there's plenty of good trial work to actually show that if you train that lamb while he's on his mum to recognise a grain or a pellet, He's got a lifetime acceptance of that. Right, so, and there are specialist um, auction plus markets now, or, or um, sales now, for finisher lambs, where, where buyers are actually sourcing repeatedly from producers that can prove that their lambs have been trained to go on the grain. And it's going to become more and more professional like that. So I think we should do more of this imprinting. You're probably all doing it now, anyway, with the way the season's gone. Promote the cost benefits of the store versus finisher lambs. As I said before, most people on most occasions, particularly the seasons that are against you, are better off selling store lambs. Let's get them off the place, let someone else buy them, someone else finish them, um, and you leave more food for your mum, for the mum. Promote the, the benefits of improved genetics, and it's great that you guys are actually um, going to be running some more ram, ram select sort of workshops, um, because we are uh, we don't push it enough, and particularly in the Merino job, and you're, again, so Merino centred here in the state. Uh, it's something I think you need to put more emphasis into as well. <clears throat> I just want to show you a couple of graphs that we use in Breadwell, Feedwell or Ram Select workshops. That's actually work that was done in WA. That's the relationship there. On the x-axis here is that the post weaning weight ASBV, Australian Sheep Breeding Value. The genetic potential for growth of those sires. 
These are groups of lambs from each of those sires. That is a very strong relationship. Those sires that are genetically better for growth rate, their lambs are genetically better for growth rate. That's with merinos. Nick Linden, Victorian Department of Ag, did some work looking at the interaction between this ASBV, post weaning weight ASBV, or potential for growth, and feed conversion. And the relationship is probably not as strong as we'd like, but there's definitely a relationship there. This is where we have increased value in the post weaning weight ASBV, so faster growing or potentially faster growing um, progeny from these size, and feed conversion ratio or efficiency. More efficient lambs down this side. Surprise, surprise, you select on growth rate and the lambs are generally more efficient. It's a win-win, they grow faster, you get them off the place two or three weeks earlier and they eat less. I think we need to focus more and more on that and that'll happen as we become more professional nationally. Once electronic tags come in and they're coming in, once they come in and we start using that sort of information, um, it's gonna be really powerful stuff. All right. We're almost there. Contractual backgrounding of lambs. I think processes, they're certainly doing it anyway, but they need to look more into um, developing alliances with producers for contract finishing. If it's gonna be a smaller scale type system, three to 5,000 head sort of feedlot, I'm quite comfortable with that being a producer own and run system. Um, and they don't necessarily need to go into the infrastructure costs that I've done in, in the analysis because 90, 95% of my clients are, are just that. You know, the table of handling anywhere up to three to 5,000 lambs, um, just using what they've got on farm. That could well be uh, one way of going. Small to medium scale, producer owned, um, or feedlot or alliances, um, where you're actually starting to actually look at an alliance where you're supplying that producer or feedlotter with the right sort of product to finish in his feedlot, and hopefully iron out some of these supply issues. A medium scale systems, 10 to 20,000 head feedlots, producer run, um, with processes involved by coordinating lamb supply. So they're responsible for the cost of bringing lambs in and buying the right product, <coughs> and or paying you a management fee to actually run that feedlot. I think for the larger scale systems, they really have to be a processor influence or own system. Um, they've got to be responsible for things like land supply, feedlot management, and they take on all the operational or financial risk. Um, those sort of systems, we, we don't have a lot of big uh, feedlot, land feedlot systems in Australia. Um, very few above 10,000 lambs on feed, anyway. Well, I'd like to, to thank uh, Jeff again and to join with, uh, join with me mm -hmm. in thanking his, for him for his presentation. Thank you.